Isn't it funny how that works? You fight mm-hmm. going to sleep with everything you got, and then something terrible happens, and then all of a sudden you can't get enough sleep. <laughs> yeah. Get enough sleep. I was just telling Levi on Sunday, I was like, I think if like my 22 year old self could jump in my 34 year old self, it'd be like, are you sick? Like, no, yeah. bro. This is just the way it is all the time. Like, yeah. this is just the way it is all the time. <laughs> So welcome, hi, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew, and I've got Father Turbo and Cyprian with me. And tonight, you guys are going to be testing your X-Men trivia, because I have been reading a lot of X-Men recently, and I'm going to ask, and I found a list online of X-Men trivia. So I'm going to ask you like five or six questions. Oh, boy. Yeah. Don't worry. It's nothing hard. It's nothing hard. Okay. All All right. In what part of the state of New York is the X Mansion? Rochester. Close. Close. Westchester. Westchester. Oh, Westchester. Westchester. Yeah. Good. Who is a regular on X Men, but is not a mutant? But he's a regular on there. I like he's one of the main villains. But, but he's not, a, not mutant. a mutant. He's not a mutant. No. He's part of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, though, I think. No clue. Yeah, I'm stumped on that one. No it's the Juggernaut. The Juggernaut's, Juggernaut's not oh, a mutant. Yeah, he's not a mutant. It's his helmet. Yeah, no, he's got a, a an emerald. The he's emerald in his emerald. helmet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bonus oh. points. That's right. That's right. Wow. Bonus points if you can name the famous X Men that he is related to. Charles Xavier. Yes. It's yeah. his is brother. He really? The stepbrother, yeah, yeah. really, yeah. yeah. See, this is, yeah, this is this. You guys, get me <laughs> I'm book. sorry, Sophie. I'm sorry. I haven't read. I haven't read X Men since the probably mid nineties, nineties, mid nineties. Which all of this is in the mid nineties stuff. I just don't remember. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, can you name uh, Colossus's real name and bonus? Colossus. Colossus? Oh, no, sorry. he's Russian. He, Russian. He's Rasputin. Yes. 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 And bonus points if you can name his sister, uh, his sister's name and her superhero name. Sure, Ileana Rasputin and Magic. Yes. Nice. nice. All right. Cool. That was good. Nice. Um, and then this one's pretty easy for father. But of what country is Storm from? Country. Yeah. Or oh, you mean continent? No. What country? <laughs> very, it's very specific about where she was born and raised. Well, she where she was born. Okay, so this is kind of a dumb question. It's not very well written. But what country was Storm raised in? Because this is I, well, kind of what country was Storm born in? Because this is kind of a trick question. Wait. So what is the question? What country I'm was so Storm sorry. born in or raised? Yeah, in? this is not a very well written question. So I'm going to do Andrew spin on it. What country was Storm born in? I don't know, Uganda? Kenya. Is it in is it in Africa? No, it is not. Is it in She's the not born in Africa? No. Unfortunately, she was born in the Bronx. Her parents then moved to Egypt. Or then she, when her parents died, she went to Kenya. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of a trick question. And then last one. I'm very, very sorry. Last one. Um what is uh who are Magneto's children? Quicksilver and Wanda, the Scarlet yes. Witch. Yeah, you got it. Very good. Man, Cyprian. Father is father's Wanda. <laughs> yeah. I mean, after after all of the at, literally after every single one of those answers was said, I was like, I think I knew that. I think I knew that. But there's no <laughs> way I was there's no way I was gonna pull that out 30 years, three decades uh, yeah. past. There's no yeah. way. I've just been reading a lot of X-Men recently. It's like the first time I've ever actually really gotten pretty heavy into X-Men, aside from the show, from the cartoons. So I'm feeling it. So um, 
Okay, so before we continue with the show, we're going to take a special moment to step aside into the serious corner for one second and talk to you about um, our parishes, St. Mary's Parish, uh, our school, Mount Tabor. So right now the headmaster, Mr. Adam, is um, kind of getting this fundraiser going for it. So... um, I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit logistically about what the school looks like. Then father can maybe give a little bit of a word on it. Um, But right off the bat, uh, it was in 2021 was the first year father. Yeah. The first formal year. Yeah. 2000, everything, you know, kind of kicked off 2020 because uh, we were trying to get the school going before that. But then when the, the apocalypse happened, it was a great um, impetus to kind of, you know, basically we, we had the buy and everyone got on board because everyone saw real quick um, what was happening and what it meant uh, for their kids and education. I mean, it's almost like you thought it was planned how quickly, <laughs> how quickly everything went to Zoom and all this other stuff kind of started going south. So uh, 2020, we did like a um, a really, you know, it's it was better than it sounded, but uh a homeschool co-op, a very, very formal homeschool co-op uh, with the intention of transitioning into the, the formal school as we understand it, uh, as, it's, as, it, as it exists now. As it exists now. So the school is wonderful. I cannot talk to you about how much the school has affected us already. So um, I grew up in a tight community of kids that went to the same school in the same church. And it was really, I was really tight with them. I was really, really close with them. And for most of the kids at Mount Tabor, that's the, that's the arrangement. So none of my kids are old enough to go yet, but as we have every intention of that being the school that they go to, there's not even a question about it. Um, so uh, father also has four children and then one graduate or three children and one graduate, something like that. Um, but right now, basically we're in the middle of a fundraiser. I'm going to link, uh, or I'm going to send Cyprian a PDF that we will link in the notes. Also, I think we might just have the notes and there are ways to donate. Uh, anything helps really anything helps. We, I, if correct me if I'm wrong, father, we don't get any government funding whatsoever. No. So this is all kind of us. This is all kind of us trying to put this together um, so we have volunteers from all over the community coming in to do their part. We have several parishioners from our church who are teachers in the school. Um, everything is run by father. You know, we do like a Wednesday liturgy every Wednesday so that the kids and then the kids have like um, classes after that regarding just the church. Correct. Right, father? A catechism. A catechism. Yeah. A catechism after that. Um Fully support the staff, fully support the headmaster. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And it's, and it's, it's a really incredible thing to sink your, it's a really incredible thing to invest in. It, it's, it's a Orthodox school for liberal arts and it's, it's classically education or it's classic education. Our um, headmaster is extremely knowledgeable. He knows exactly what he's doing. So while I continue to go look at the bullet points to make sure I covered all of the bases I'm supposed to, father, if you wouldn't mind saying a little word about it. I mean, honestly, I think the biggest thing is that, um, like with everything, um, you know, I'm involved with with everything that um, we're about. It's you have to, you know, live it. And so the reality is, is you know, all the talking points that we talk about each each episode here about um, the state of the world, and um, not just in regards of fear and trying to, you know, uh, escape from the world, but what the world should actually be you know, and raising young souls and getting them to see the world um, with with a lens of discernment and wisdom and hope. Um, And I mean, ultimately, you know, the way I see it is these are the next leaders, you know, unless the Lord tarries, these are the the next Orthodox leaders, um, at least on this continent. So um, having a big picture. And I think like with anything else, you know, We've talked about people need to build their ark. You know, we built our ark and um, if nothing else, you know, look to see what we're doing. And may you be inspired to build your ark because it's needed. You know, uh, I don't think there's um, any doubt in people's minds 
if you can, you should really pull your kids out of public school mm. and get them to a place where they're not just being um, formed and uh, trained to become, um, you know, consumers and producers for the machine. Um, but rather you want to give them an, a, an education in which um, their young souls can begin to discern the true and the good and the beautiful. And that's the, that is the recipe for eternity. So that's what we're doing uh, at Mount Tabor. We're raising kids to be transfigured in the light of Christ. So if you can help, uh, that'd be wonderful. God bless you. If you can't, at least check out what we're doing and then maybe um, you'll be inspired to do something similar in your community. Amen. And I want to, I want to I wanna just, just jump on that and like put a, as a parent who's Orthodox and who, you know, has been participating in sort of, or seeing the things that have certainly occurred. And, you know, that's been part of my conversion over these last few years. Um, I think, and I see this a lot, and I know that, there's probably quite a few people listening who are parents who feel this way that, you know, there used to be this, this value on, you know, the, the, like the content of the education, uh, much more than the pedagogy, mm -hmm. I think of the education, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic. And it was like, well, what school has the best math? What school has the best reading scores to come out of it? All of these things. And I think now we're starting to see, you know, that's, that's got to shift. Because all of the information is there. Kids are learning on their own. I mean, my my kids just in their just consumption of things that are out there learned their math and their ABCs and all, without me even like before I even tried, right? When they were very, very young. And it's like the things that are that they're not getting in school. I mean, is the it is the holistic, it is the spiritual, mm -hmm. it is the it is the outlook, it is the phronema, really, mm -hmm. that it's like Without that, who cares? Right. And as a matter of fact, you're actually worse off. That's right. I was going to say yeah. it's actually worse. You're, it you're worse off to yeah. be more, as we saw from who got poked, you're right. actually worse off to be more highly educated, right? If the pedagogy is wrong. If the pedagogy is wrong. That's right. And the person who designed our school system, Mr. Adam Lockridge, the father of four, and was also involved in an Orthodox mission, like an Orthodox uh, homeschooling program. This is the guy who's designing this school, right? Who designed like the public education system, but the Rockefellers. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to say like, there, there's a stark difference there. Father prays with them every morning or they say prayers every morning. Um, you know, there's I icons. Give them, yeah, I give them a little word. I give the kids a little word each day. It's, yeah. it's really good. I mean, honestly, the I think the big thing too is to um, to kind of get back to the super insane in regards of like the approach, the pedagogy, and it's being holistic. It's it's you know the problem is when you just give someone information, yeah, that's in a void, right, and it and it doesn't have any real implication and ramification in the, in the mind of a child. I mean, if you can hear my voice, that's probably what your education was like. Was mine you know, was. And and I think I think we all understand to some degree what that means, you know, um, because when you've I mean, part of your conversion into the church is in some ways undoing that, if that makes sense, because the church is teaching you to pull these dichotomies outside of from from, you know, pull the to remove the dichotomies and the the, the system is designed to insert dichotomies. And that's one of the big thing is that, you know, understanding that math is a language of God, mm -hmm. you know, um, what's discovered in science, not the theory of science as a, as a method, but what science discovers is the language is a language of God, you mm -hmm. know, um, and even reading great works, um, especially if they're not quote unquote Christian, you need to have, a, 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 you need to have the faculties to discern that. To be able to pull the dross from, you know, the precious, to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff um, and to give to give someone, to give a young soul those those skills, um, again, to, to apprehend, you know, wisdom and beauty uh, wherever it's found, because that that's a big thing is. 
I think in regards of, you know, our project here, just with the Royal Path, I mean, isn't that a big part of it too, is it would be wrong. I think, I think all three of us would agree that, you know, we're not talking about a Benedict option in the sense of trying to completely run away and build some sort of hole to hide in and wait for them to get you because that doesn't work. And there's, there's nothing courageous about that. And that's not what Christ calls us to. Um, but we are to um, also realize what our Lord taught us about being in the world and not of it. So how do you do it? And I think this is a key thing. This is what, you know, what we're trying to do. And this is what I'm trying to do um, with all my spiritual children is to give them the discernment, and the tools as best as I can to be ambassadors for Christ in the world. And that ambassadorship, the wages that we earn in that ambassadorship is eternal life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are the wages of our work in this world of being ambassadors. So that's that's what we're doing. That's what we're up to. So and there aren't many there there aren't really many schools like this, if any, right? Especially in North America or in the Western only, Hemisphere, right? I mean, oh. there's literally a, like one handful of you know truly Orthodox schools, you know, and we need so to you're investing in. in a prototype basically yeah. like so any so anybody who you know if anybody's contributing to the school you're investing in a prototype and a model that you know potentially can can be used uh, again you know and potentially for your own children so it's like as somebody who builds things i know like this is the phase man mm. that like that's the phase that's the imp very, very important phase. I'm going to say it one more time. It's Mount Tabor, mounttaborschool.org slash donate. So M-O-U-N-T-T-A-B-O-R school.org slash donate, backslash donate. So um, huh. please at least check just... the description. It'll be in there. Links. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And whatever, whatever can help, you know, even two, three bucks. It all, it all helps. God bless you. So. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And then, yeah, I mean, almsgiving. So get some, get some, uh, get some treasures in heaven. So I actually, I don't, we don't really have a topic planned for tonight a little bit, but I thought that this would be actually a smooth transition into it really struck me last week because I've been trying a little bit harder recently because of the fast, you know, I've been making a little bit of extra effort. And of course I take one step and God takes a hundred steps to me. And that whole process of learning to parrot information back onto an exam, that was my whole basis for learning, you know? And like, I think one of the things that being on the Royal path takes is an ability to like, is be able to discern and understand what sits well with you and what sit and what doesn't sit well with you. Because that was one of the things that hit me in 2020 is this whole education system to the degree that I participated in, because I was also homeschooled and I felt that that was a lot more beneficial to me than being in public education. But one of the things that like really stuck out to me about once the 2020 stuff started to come together for me <clears throat> was I was like, Oh wow. I have felt this for a while. I just wasn't, I didn't want to listen to it. So like I, I, a part of me, and I even remember telling someone who I was arguing with about the masks was I was like, yeah, so what it may be a, um, like a, it may be like a good luck charm, but I don't care if it makes people more comfortable. I'm going to wear talisman? It. a talisman. So, and that's exactly what it is. But I remember thinking like, I, I will, and like, so like some part of me already knew this wasn't adding up. Like this wasn't, but like, because of like the, um, and I don't want to blame it all on the education system. It also has to do with the hours and hours of intake of TV I watched growing up. Mm -hmm. But the education system, you know, that coupled with the other things really taught me to be like, no, I can pair it and regurgitate information very well. I cannot think. I have to learn how to think again. And, you know, part of that is also, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's encouraged by being an alcoholic, you know, alcoholics say, try not to think too much, you know, to the degree that you can try and shut this down as best as you can and just keep going. But even then, 
there's a whole different way of receiving information there. Well, that, well, is... that, well, well, that's that's a different kind of thinking, right? Because what's talked about in twelve step and in those circles is not so much like thinking, but ruminating. Yes. Right? And ruminating and critical thinking aren't the same thing. And and you know what I mean? Sure. So, and that's yeah. what I was going to say is this whole other way of accepting something mm -hmm. before you know it, accepting I am powerless over alcohol and then letting the information come to you, like arriving at, you see the point, let God build the bridge to that point. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So in the interest of, you know, what's going on and unless you guys have another topic and that's totally cool too, there's this whole process of like having to like regain your mind. Like basically, and like father, uh, a homily father gave a long time ago was, you know, the prodigal son squandered his inheritance. And part of that inheritance we could see in our personal lives and our everyday lives is our mind and our heart and our emotions. And we squander it. So as we go back, as we repent, as we fall down and, and beg father for forgiveness, we get it back. And we start to get our brain back into the point where like, everyone's yelling all around you of what to think what to think and you're like i don't have to believe any of this right. well like, this, this, is a, this is actually really good because um I, I think one of the thing is we'll even use a real-time example of the conversation because uh if you don't mind being on display um so like you know get our brain back and i know you're just kind of setting it up but that's even part of how the trap is set up is that we will have communication, whatever that is, you know, kind of interpersonal communication. Um, we'll have passive communication where we're receiving information through a screen or through some means which someone's speaking to us. And so we're getting the gist of what someone's saying. But the problem is, is that certain words are used and we will um, pass over what's being said because we get the gist. But the thing is, is that doesn't always happen in um, polite or friendly society. So mm. in other words, like I would say, okay, stop right there. It's like, well, it's actually not about the brain. That's part of the problem is that we're taught that the mind is synonymous with the brain and it's not. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things about, you know, acquiring an orthodox worldview mindset um, is that you have to begin to understand, you know, the deeper, more holistic, uh, the, the true anatomy, like what it, you know, what truly constitutes a human being. And because there's terms that overlap, but that aren't always the same. And some things don't, don't correlate, you know? So we're not, we, we, we have to be careful because we need to understand, like going back to the prodigal son, you know, the squandering of, of the, that inheritance, you know, um, in the Orthodox church, we call it the noose, right? And what is the noose? Okay, well, noose is translated as mind. But when we say mind, what are we talking about? Are we talking about the brain? Or are we talking about something else, you know? And I think this is, it's funny because I was asked this today, um, getting kind of talking about the school, I was asked about this day, it's like, well, why an Orthodox school? Like, what's the distinction? What's the distinctive of an Orthodox education versus like, let's say a Roman Catholic or a Protestant or just, you know, a good, you know, kind of classical uh, pagan, you know, like education. And, and I would get into this understanding of the noose and how, you know, even though that term is not as ubiquitous as it maybe should be uh, amongst, because no one walks around being like, my news, my news, my news. But we have an awareness of it, even if we don't um, attach the vocabulary to it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the things about, um, I mean, to be really frank, you know, the the Eastern Church and the, the, the ontological change that happens when you are united to the church liturgically and sacramentally, you begin to experience things imperceptibly that you maybe can't always explain. And, and what I mean by that is not even just like 
because you weren't reading the glossary of the Philokalia or you weren't, you know, um, doing the extra homework for your competitive religions class. I mean, even people who quote unquote have an understanding of these things, you can know something, but to know it and to experience, excuse me, mm. you can have an awareness of the information of something, but to experience mm -hmm. it are two different things. And so mm -hmm. what happens is people will be like, you know, they, they quote unquote read their, read their way into the church. Oh yeah. I read my way in the church. And I was speaking about this with uh, Cyprian's Godfather today. He, he brought this up after liturgy about, you know, there's a lot of people who are, you know, quote unquote orthodox and they're, they are in a kind of um, captivity of historicity, mm -hmm. right? So they look at history and they, they approach history and, uh, and uh, you know, even as orthodox as a very kind of like Western um, forensic approach which is really, really problematic because oftentimes there's more truth in a um, hagiographic account that may read to, to, you know, the brain as folklore. And it may not even be a one for one in history, but it's a more true account than the, you know, bullet point of this is what happened in you know 395 and blah 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 like sure. that experience the experience of, of god right because this is really what we're talking about the experience of god becomes something that people have to taste and experience first and they can't always describe it or put their finger on it because we're talking about god mm -hmm. we're not talking about something where exclusively it's about what you can observe because remember, you know, if you, <laughs> where does the power lie in the one who's observing or the one who's or the or the one who's observed? What's well, the one who's observing, right? I would say to you, we're always being observed, but by who? Right? We think that we're observing the world, we're observing everything else. And so everything's, you know, left to our judgment. Right. But when we start to back back up and then we hear what the church is teaching us about. What does it mean to be human, right? What are the, like, what is, what is your mind? What is your soul? What is your heart? What, what are these things really, right? And that's the kind of um, knowledge that we need to have so that we can become discerning. And as we become discerning, we not only can detect where um, forces are seeking to pull us off the path of truth, but more importantly, we begin to pick up the breadcrumbs that God leaves for us so that we can enter into, you know, our, our, our inheritance, which is theosis, you know, but you have to begin to really appreciate knowledge. And, and, and I don't mean knowledge in regards of like information, but knowledge in regards of, you know, experience, you know, and the, the, the process of information and experience becoming knowledge, you know, and that, that begins with knowing like who and what we are. Right. Saint Saint Paisius only had like a fourth grade education. That's right. But by the end of his life, I mean, like doctors, lawyers, politicians are going to him for advice on like what to do. So, and then Cyprian, I saw you had a question, but real quick, Father, I had someone break it down for me a long time ago, and I wanted to hit, have your thoughts. I've actually wanted to know this for a little while that there's a Western way of knowing things, of acquiring knowledge, in which you build a case. You know, like you build and arrive at a conclusion, right? Mm -hmm. So da, 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 this is it. So you're going up, you're building up. And then there's the Eastern way of, of understanding things, which is accepting the knowledge and then the information will be given to you. You know what I mean? So like the example that was given to me was accept you're an alcoholic. You don't have to build a case for it. Don't think of the DWIs. Don't think of the wives leaving, blah, 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 blah. Think of you are an alcoholic. You have accepted that boom, the knowledge will be given to you. Like it will be, it will be given to you. So I kind of wanted to know what your thoughts were on that. Like, is that sound? Is that something? Yeah, I mean, that... it's a little, the way, the way I explained it, it, you know, it's kind of rough, but I would say yes. Um, because real I simple... don't need to understand the Trinity. I just need to accept that the Trinity is. Yes. And moreover, you can't understand the Trinity. I mean, that that's one of the points that we, we were talking about we were, we were speaking about 
Islamic apologetics, you know, with, with, uh, uh, Muhammad Barbie, I can't remember his name, but, um, <laughs> you know, when you begin to understand that, like I was sp <laughs> speaking of, uh, Mark Claire, I was, I was speaking about this with him, like the skeptic, the, the, the person who's a skeptic, they wield their skepticism in such a way in which they, they view it as, you know, a, a type of armor or a type of badge, but really it, it becomes a blinder. It becomes something that um, impedes their ability to experience um, these things that we're speaking about, right? And that doesn't mean like you just become, you know, some, um, some what what is it, rube? Some rube that just, is that the term? Is that the yeah, card term? That's that's yeah. uh, okay yeah I'll yeah the, a rube or a mark or whatever yeah yeah, yeah it, it's not about just like okay you know whatever huckster says to me I'll, I'll take it that's not what we're talking about you know because the interesting thing is in order to really have discernment like the fathers the fathers teach us that discernment is the greatest like virtue to achieve and discernment is to be able to tell what's true and what's false what's right and what's wrong you know what's of god and what's not of god but in order to do that there's a measure of um acceptance hum it really it's humility i think that's the better way to put it is humility all you need to do is to be humble and that that's the that's the beginning of entering into that state right oh, and, and remember okay. humility isn't like i'm a worm i'm not worm. that's not humility that's that's you know vainglory that's vainglory like when we mean when i speak of humility we're talking about honesty like the fact that you're really not the center of the universe. You're not the greatest thing ever. You don't know everything. If you can just start there, then then you're on your way. And then once you once you begin that process, all kinds of things open up to you, because now you now you are not getting in the way. But without that, you're always getting in the way because you know better, or, or you know you you refuse to accept something because it's gonna disturb your perception of yourself or, or the way you oh, want the world to be. There it is. There it is. Yeah. When the world starts I think there, to there's happen. there's also this and I hope my connection's not just horrible because it seems like it's been going in it's and a, out. But it's a little laggy, but that's okay. A little, little laggy. Okay. So it seems like there is um you know this what you're talking about there, Andrew, with the like building the case or like that they're sort of reversed of one another. It seems like there is this fatal flaw in that that way of thinking that is you, you start from a position supposedly where you say like, I have no presuppositions. Yeah. <laughs> I don't feel one way or the other about this yeah. thing. I'm just trying to get more information. And then when I have enough information, mm -hmm. I will feel one way or the other about it. And it's like, well, first off, that's just not true. Mm -hmm. So yes. that's just like a lie and a lack of self-awareness. You come into everything with presuppositions. Yes. The problem with those type of people is, they have convinced themselves that they don't have presuppositions, so they never never examine their presuppositions. Yes. Right? Whereas the other side is like, not only do I have presuppositions, I have made a, a, a choice of which presupposition I'm going to begin with. And then the only I will change my presupposition if, as I move forward, that's not working. So it's this much more pragmatic way of looking at it that it's like, in order for me to move through the world, I need to adopt a worldview, right? I'm open to altering that worldview if, as I move through the world, my life is falling apart. Like, you should. <laughs> sure. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, sure. then you need to reexamine it. But if you take on a worldview and then you move through the world and your life works, it's like, well, that's the fact that my life is working is the evidence that this is like a, that this worldview works. And mm -hmm. I think that it's like, this, this is what I, I try when people are like, when I talk about tradition with people and they just, this is the thing about tradition that I don't really know why. And maybe it's because I've done a lot of traditional things. Like I've been involved in many different kind of traditional things. And it's like, look, people don't keep doing something for 2000 years if for it real. doesn't make their lives better. For like real. billions of people don't repeat the same actions over and over and over again for billions of years, uh, for billions of years, for thousands <laughs> of years, for billions of years, maybe for thousands of years, if it doesn't make their life better. Yeah. Right. And, and so it's like, you know, when somebody who has some sort of 
ideology that's basically like 50 years old and they're going to try to argue against tradition as being like as being backwards it's like dude you don't even you're so far gone yeah you you don't know what's good you have no idea what's good so like you could just like you need to be saved really Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really and it and it's so interesting that like in this most technological of times when like oh the science the science we've got these crazy new technologies and blah 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 the people who came out of it the most whole and sane were all traditional people it was yeah. all people living by tradition yeah <laughs> and it's like so i guess it's still it still <laughs> works better it still works better yeah. you right. know right i mean i i would i would just add to that that um you know, and and I think it's I think everyone understands that, because um, there's an idea that there's an there's this overlapping situation where tradition, as a phenomena, in a kind of more broad universal sense, has value, but also too we make a distinction between, you know, tradition just on the whole, which has value, versus our tradition, right? Because people can and will and do double down, right? I, I just want to make that clear too, because there's plenty of people who will do something and they're raised in it and they can think, well, this is all there is. Um, they may not have the means or the faculties to, you know, on a personal level to want to like diverge from that and break out from it. And so, you, you know what I mean? Because I don't want to give, I don't want to, I don't want to not call out the reality that there's people who, you know, and, and I think there is a, I think there is a scale. I mean, it's like a person who has a traditional worldview in a, in a more kind of um, axial sense, right. They're going to fare better than a materialist. Father, what does axial mean? Um, so when we say like axial, like the axial age, which is this this point in time when you look uh, in in world history, where there's um, you know for for lack of a better word, it's a long season, right? So a season isn't quite the right word, but you know it's it's when these you know when the when world teachers and the kind of advent of world religions begins to emerge. Okay. Right. Oh. Um, okay. Okay. So this this is what we mean by the axial age. So you see where humanity on a whole begins to, you know, take these steps forward. Right. Um, and this is, this is part of the gospel is that man on his own, this is the tower of Babel man on his own is always seeking to um, achieve what he inherently knows is, is, is within him but is never able to do without God, if that makes sense, right? Okay. So this is this is this is why we can say, um, yeah, there, there's there's wisdom in various traditions. There's wisdom to be found. Um, and I would submit, you know, getting back to you know, kind of like this is the thread. Um, you know, Christ is the king over them all, right? Christ, Christ is the king over, I mean, that's Forgive me, but if I could just like if I could do this, I don't think I've ever done this before, but those three figures right there that everyone sees every episode, those are the three wise men. And there's a reason why I have the three wise men behind me. Um because you know, I'm very much um this this insight in which we are to take the gifts. Um, of culture, the gifts of our nations, the gifts of the world, and, and offer them to Christ. The three wise men were were philosophers, pagan philosophers and, and you know sages who brought their gifts to the Christ child and, and offered them, right? And, and I believe that, I mean, that's the approach to have. I think that's, you know, as an Orthodox Christian, that is the great freedom and responsibility that you begin to inherit and that is 
you know, to him who much is given, much is much is required. And so we are given um, the adoption papers, uh, the enrollment to the, you know, to the court of the king. We're given access to the king of all, the Pantocrator, who sits over all things, you know, maker of the ruler over heaven and earth which includes all cultures, all philosophies, any anything that has existed, anything that is a substance, Christ rules over that thing, right? Over, over the nations. And he judges those things righteously, you know, with wisdom and power. And so what that means is the reality of tradition in its best light Outside of Christ, in its best light, tradition is, is the thing that has facilitated the preservation of authentic human experience. Mm -hmm. That that's that's what tradition is. And, and so that we actually have we you know we get on board with. And, and this is why, you know, Christ is king. And when we say Christ is king, it's we mean it very differently than the way. Someone else is using Christ as king right now, I think, you know, um, because we don't we don't have to we don't fall into the same trap that that, you know, quote unquote, a lot of evangelical fundamentalists do because we're not scared. We don't you know, I, I remember I remember people um, questioned my wife and I for teaching, you know, our kids um you know, world history and some mythology. They're like, that's kind of weird, you know, like, you know, from the a more fundamentalist evangelical mindset. And I was like, no, you're like, you don't understand. Like, it's because they truly have Christ. It's actually going to be this great, you know, kind of contrast to, to give highlight to the, to the, the all encompassing power and, and just into, I want my children to be able to see Christ wherever he, wherever he can be seen. Sure yeah right um and so that is the way we have to approach tradition but we also have to be very clear about the fact that you know our tradition isn't lumped in with all other traditions yeah. just because there, there there's commonality there's there's an overlap but you know like i was saying tradition being you know the extrapolation of authentic human experience but for us holy tradition is the experience of the holy spirit which is a which is a different thing, which transcends those limitations. It isn't simply just authentic human experience, but it is the, the totality of the experience of God and man, the Holy Spirit and man. That that's what our holy tradition is. It's it is the revelation and the preservation of the uh, synergy between God and man. Right. Yeah. That's that's what our that's what our holy tradition is. That that's what our church music is, our hymnography, our iconography, our um, you know, our architecture, um, and all of these different ways in which it's been reflected in the various ethnic historical contexts, they all are all complementary and they all make a different facet of the one gem, yeah. which is very different than the kind of patchwork that you would, you know, speaking from an axial point of view, that's like a patchwork that you can kind of look at. But for us, you know, there, there are these different facets that um, com compromise a whole, um, a whole beautiful, uh, you know, a gem, uh, a person, if, so, if that makes sense. Is it, is it and this is also where like we get the, you know, <laughs> the, the truth of orthodoxy, the orthodox tradition baptizing certain right. aspects of external traditions as it moves to a people that it'll be oh so you got so you so right. part of this record of human experience that you have some of this has to go because right. you were interacting with demons here that's right so like some of that has to go but oh hey th this is a, this is of christ yeah that's right like you were he was he was here in this that's way right. in in that's this right. experience i mean that's that's a really good thing because like, I think actually like uh, an example that came to mind when father was talking about, like, I don't know, the phrase that comes to mind is that Christ things lack center, like they lack a center. There's just like, so Christmas, 
we're in like we're one week away from western christmas and like i've been reading a lot of orthodox posts a lot of orthodox blogs that talk about like the sad state of people without christ trying to find like the magic of christmas there's like you know they can do all these externals they can get the tree they can drink the eggnog you know but like again i've been trying a little bit harder but it's like it's so devoid of meaning well, you know i mean you know what that produces they need I... to listen to that kenny rogers they need <laughs> to listen to the homemade christmas in kentucky because yeah. there's no tree there's no none of that but i but you know there's something there's something there they got, they got the heart they got that kenny rogers heart but they don't got they don't quite got i mean the well the thing is is without christ christmas breeds you know there's a there is a uh, kind of cultural trope that's becoming increasingly more true, which is, you know, oh, Christmas is the time of suicides. Christmas is the time of despair. Christmas is the time of isolation. Christmas yeah. is the time when I fall apart. Christmas is the time when I start drinking. So like, all of that is real because yeah, that's what's that all about? Of, what's that all about? Well, it's the fruit of generations of people having quote unquote Christmas without Christ. Yeah that's what it that's what it produces right but when you have christ then any great story uh any great christmas story which will have some sort of kind of uh you know uh, tragedy or they, they, there's, there's redemption there like all those things where does that come from i mean that's birthed out of the gospel that god became man right but if you don't have that then you have no you have no real actual hope everything is left to some sort of sentimental um you know some bag of sentimental feelings you know and 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 that yeah. that is depressing yeah. right? if, if all you have left is kind of ruminating of, of what you've lost like okay you want to ruminate on like the, the loved ones you've lost and you'll never see again because there's no hope uh, well, okay, great. Of course, no wonder you know Enjoy you want drinking alone in a dark. And, room. and no wonder you want to drink alone and, and do all that. It's like, so I mean, that's the fruit of it, and and that's why that kind of trope has grown, because people have taken, they've literally tried to banish Christ from, you know, from from Christmas. It just it lacks center, and that's been my experience. Is like the only reason any of this stuff makes any sense. The traditions of Christmas is from like a level of like because we're in a fast is a level of self-restraint is like a level of not like getting too drunk at the christmas party is the level of not pigging out all the time on sugar and like a hot chocolate and you know the spiked eggnog and stuff the re the only way that really any of this stuff really makes sense is of like i remember i'll finish my 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 uh not very well put together thought with the very first nativity that i spent as a catechumen finally felt like christmas again it finally like that magic was back like that feeling and like it was so dumb but i had just forgotten christ you know i i threw my debauchery through like my drunken years and everything i just lost christ and like that image of like no it is actually about christ made like that feeling i had of when i was a child come back like in a very very real way and Anybody who well, knows what, me. Well, what happens is, is that people they want to feast, but without having any reason to feast. Yeah. So, so feasting without a reason to feast is is called gluttony. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, That's all it shirt. is is gluttony. That's a sure. Right. And so the thing is, is you know, it doesn't mean anything, right? And and yes, the I would submit that the the fasting heightens that experience, but even it's like Saint John Chrysostom in regards of the the Paschal homily, like. Those of you who have fasted, and those of you who haven't fasted, those of you who've been faithful, those of you who are coming at the at the eleventh hour, come, like because how can he say that? How can he say what do you mean? Those who didn't fast and those who fasted, how are they both coming? Well, because it isn't about your efforts or your lack of effort; it's about Christ. Yeah, and so that's the thing: is the see Christ. And not in some sort of like mythopoetic way, you know what I mean? Like reality, Christ encompasses all possibilities. And, and that's why we worship him. That's why he is the hero. That's why every hero story, if it's an authentic hero story, is pointing to Christ in some real way. Not because, 
you know, not because of the way the, the, the story of Christ is constructed, but because cr the Christ, not just, yes, Christ, the Logos, I mean, his existence and his incarnation is the pattern of reality. Yes, yes. And so anything that we experience that speaks to us on a deep, profound level is because it's resonating with that true pattern, with that prototype, with the icon. It's he an is, imitation. He is, he is the icon, right? And so, you know, I think this is the thing too in regards of with like, you know, understand. <laughs> I, man, I was I was thinking about this. Um, I was thinking about how you know ubiquitous conspiracy theory, the term conspiracy theory, is now in like Western society. <laughs> and I was really thinking about like what that means. You know, like what does that really mean? Was it facilitated? And like you know, I mean, we could spin out on that. You know, for the next two hours, probably talking about how it. You can't help but but feel that there's a measure of intention there to <laughs> undermine people's ability to actually try to perceive and apprehend what's true. Yes. It's like one hundred percent. Yes, one hundred percent. You know That's what I mean? That's so visceral. It's but I think it's also, um, you know, it it does go to this thing that you said, like Andrew, that it's it's uncentered. I think maybe I would like. I would like distill that down a little more. And even as you said about father with the feasting, that it's like, it's disoriented. So mm -hmm. it's like, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And the answer just can't be because it's Christmas, because then that, that seeks that, that, that demands another question. Why does it matter that it's Christmas? Mm -hmm. You know? And I mean, the cliche, like Jesus is the reason for the season. It's like, yeah, but that's actually, super super deep because if you don't know the reason for why you're doing something mm -hmm. and i think that father this is the this is where the this is where the tie-in with the conspiracy theory is that it's like basically what it becomes is like you know all the people at the christmas party why are they all at the christmas party and it's like they all have different reasons like if you ask them what's happening here mm -hmm. this that you're inside of what's happening What's the reason that you're here? Why are we celebrating? Why does it matter? All of these things. If you don't have an orientation, which is Christ is the only one that makes any sense, all of a sudden you're spun off and any, one, any explanation is as valid as the next. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, that's what I've seen with like the, the conspiracy. That's really this, this, this phenomenon of the conspiracy theory <coughs> is that like, what, what I have a problem with it, the reason why I've always had a problem with it is that it's like, I can't falsify. Like, I can't falsify any of what you think this guy thinks is this, he thinks is this. And also, it doesn't then translate into anything else. There's no principle at the core of it, right? Like, okay, if I believe what you're saying about this, then I can use it in my life. Mm. Whereas if it's like Ephesians 6.12, right? That it's just like, not flesh and blood principalities mm -hmm. and powers mm -hmm. it's like that one mm -hmm. that one mm -hmm. yeah that explains mm -hmm. it all mm -hmm. i can use that mm -hmm. right and it explains all the conspiracy theories too mm -hmm. <laughs> like it explains it all and so i think like it's that it's disoriented mm -hmm. i think that's the feeling that a lot of people have about christmas now is like what's it what are you pointing at? why are you doing this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course, that's going to lead to depression when it's because you're just if, if you're an unhappy person, you're just going to find the worst thing and be like, well, I can never have that, you know. Absolutely. But, you know, there's another por portion of it, too, which it just kind of came to me. I was thinking about this is um, how the conspiracy theory, part of the problem with it, part of the weaponizing of it or the, the result or the fruit of it being weaponized. <clears throat> you i see it it kind of an explicit it's not the only example but it's really explicit in this example in regards of like take for instance this kind of current debate um because of like kanye and kyrie irving and all that stuff with like the hebrew israelite stuff and all that it's like a perfect example of how it's weaponized just like the devil does and gives people some sense of you don't want to be duped you don't want to be duped. And so since you don't want to be duped, 
anything that sounds counter to a kind of established fact, just because uh -huh. it is, you know what I mean? It's this kind of um, and our, um, anachronistic aspect of it. You know what I mean? I'm going to tear it down just for the sake of tearing it down because, you know, either I perceive I wasn't a part of it or I perceive that like, you know, everything needs to be torn down. I'm going to build something new in my image, right? Or or I, what I want to be image. And, and I find that to be very fascinating to me because I was going to say this earlier on in the conversation. One of the things that I think people need to adapt or excuse me, they need to adopt is are you a person that seeks to have your experiences and the external world confer conform to your perspective mm -hmm. or will you conform to truth? Mm. Is that, do you see what I'm saying? Sure. That, that's like a huge, huge. thing. That's a huge, huge thing. And so what the conspiracy theory as a phenomena does, it allows someone to be like, okay, number one, I'm an expert. I'm my own expert. I'm a throw out. I'm going to throw out um, ideas and opinions in such a way that they're going to be perceived, interpreted as fact. And once I do that, then I'm able going to, I'm also going to be able to now, you know, lie to myself, even though I won't say it that way, you know, and then in turn begin to influence others around me, which in turn is what I want to do anyways, because I don't really want to conform myself to truth. I want to conform the world around me. This is, and listen, this is really deep because, you this know, is this is thing. one of the, one of the big portions of why mental um, illness is endemic, right? If I could, you know, mental illness is endemic because people, one of the core things of mental illness is there's something that someone who's mentally ill will, there's, there's, well, there's a couple, but one core facet that all people, you know, I know it's an absolute statement. So is all people who are mentally ill, they'll share this one thing is they struggle with, um, they, they, they have to externalize everything that that's part of what causes the madness is an inability to deal with some sort of phenomena situation or truth in which you must conform yourself to right people with people with mental health issues personality disorders they have this common tenant we will find in all of them is an inability to deal with this propensity to externalize everything right do you, are you following what i'm saying could you give like it's a real basically you're yeah you're saying that basically like they, if they feel discomfort they're towards anything that they're that they're the only approach that they have available is to try to change or to need the outside world to change to meet their discomfort Bingo. rather than being able to go internally and be like, Bingo. where is this discomfort coming from? Can Bingo. I change myself? Bingo. Oh. That's something that's ubiquitous across the spectrum of mental health and personality disorders. They all will have, there, there's a myriad of other things that they won't have in common, but that thing you'll find in every single disorder, every single mental health issue. Right. Because, that, okay. That's, that's consistent. So, right? and, and I'm so sorry for in the step work, it talks about a restoration of sanity, a uh, step two. And I'm sorry, I'm going on and on about the 12 steps, but part of it is, is that like wife or no wife, you know, job or no job, you can stay sober. Like mm -hmm. it does not matter about your external circumstances. It's inside of you. It's that's how right. you, and that's then right. there's this like, that's right. There's this like cartoon of two dudes <laughs> hanging in a dungeon, uh, you know, like all, you know, obviously been there a while with long beards all ragged out and hanging from the chains. And then one dude says to the other dude is like, at least we're sober. Yeah. And like, you know, that's like, yeah. that's because that's, I run into it all the time is like recovery is not about like making your life suit what you want. It's about yeah. being able to handle life as it comes. Yeah. And, this, and is, this, this is, is also, so, so forgive me, father. Like, I, I just want to bang on this point because like, it's something that I also am very conscious of and very aware of is like, it's why suffering is good. Uh -huh. Like most people won't. I, I, I'm a weird person because I actively from a very young age sought to subject myself to unnecessary suffering, right? Like unnecessary suffering. And so 
or not it, it was very necessary right mm -hmm. because there right. were several things in my life as a young man where i realized one of them was living in a Kyokushin dojo right and training and doing nothing but training and fighting and, and being a uchideshi under a very like rough sensei right and okay. lived that life when i left that i was like nothing i ever do in my life and this has been true will ever be that hard mm -hmm. one of the reasons it was hard is because i'd never done anything that hard mm -hmm. i never lived a life that was that hard before where where everything i mean everything stripped away Right. Basically like mon monastics, monasticism, you know what I mean? Right. It was basically monasticism with getting punched and kicked every day. Mm -hmm. Right. And running incredible amounts. Of my body was basically destroyed at the end, but it was like nothing in my life will ever be this hard again. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the guys that I was there with, he became a Marine later, you know, I, and, and I talked with him years later and he was like, dude, Marine boot camp after that, after what right. we went through, he's like nothing. Right. I was laughing at the people I mean, in a Marine boot camp. I'm really scared right now because I'm going to say something that I think, oh man, this might be one I might regret. So there's a moment when those of us who've converted from some sort of, especially some sort of Christian context, there's a moment when we realized, oh, this is this is really hard. Hmm. Oh, um, like all those kind of tropes of like it's a free gift and like all those weird like you know the the weird Jesus peoplely like you know um, cheese sandwich and sandals Jesus you know like when you realize like oh man um, that's not it like. This hurts. Is the this hurts. This hurts. If you find it, like, and and that's the thing with this whole, and that's why there's no point in in getting in those types of arguments with someone who's like, you know, the evangelical or the reform guy, like, works. You're all works. It's like, man, you don't even get it, man. You, you know what I mean? And, and and that's where it's so important. The one thing the evangelical mindset gets right is it's so important to have this. It's the one that's the only thing they get right, which is it is about having a relationship with God, because if you don't have that, then it is almost a despairing thing. It's the rich young ruler, right? Christ comes, rich young ruler says, what if, you know, what's the whole the law, blah, 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 you know, love your neighbor yourself. It's like, you've answered well, you know, it's like, what, I've kept the law for my youth. What am I lacking? Sell all that you have and follow me. And then he went away sad yeah. because he had many possessions. That's the thing that a lot of people don't get. It's like, man, this is hard. I just want to give up. I'm like, yep. Yep. This is hard. But the thing is, is if you're saying hard, you want to give up, I would submit to you it's because you haven't seen the rabbit, right? You've never seen the rabbit, like right? the hounds, right? There's the hounds that are on the hunt and they all got the scent of the rabbit. But if they if they lose that scent, they'll give up. The hound that won't give up is the one who's seen the rabbit. Yes. Even if he loses the scent, he's going to keep going. And, and that's what you need to have to do this. That and and that's the hard truth about the gospel that nobody really wants to kind of hear, because the thing is, is it's for everyone. Yeah. And and anyone and everyone has the potential to be saved because God desires it all to be saved. But here's the thing: you have to want that, and you have to know what that thing is. And what that thing is is this is why I think people don't don't understand either. You have to want to be with Christ. And, and, I, and that's why he's so offensive. Because <laughs> there are people who legitimately hate Christ. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, no, they don't. No, they just don't know Christ. No, they no. Yeah. They've encountered him and they've chosen to hate him. The devil knows Christ better than, you know what I mean? And, and has chosen to hate him. And I think this is all really important because getting back to the conspiracy thing and the way that it's really 
been weaponized in the way that it's used to to really cause people to lose their souls because it isn't even just about being non-religious or anything like that it's just like you're able to create a narrative by which you can lull yourself to sleep if that if that makes sense that's what it is that's what it is you know what i mean yeah. and, it, and it's like that's why it's so tough because you know we always uh again it's why we do this project right because it's such a temptation to want to just glob on it's because we are so um beaten down you know it, it's such a temptation to want to glob onto anything that even kind of remotely smacks of being friendly towards our world you know our point of view but we can't do that we have to continually you know that's why i feel like we can never stop talking about it until i don't know until when because we have to stay uncomfortable because that's where christ is like the only thing i can tell you is that it, if you're uncomfortable then you're probably in a, you're probably with christ yeah because christ you know what i mean christ he's on the cross and he's so on the if cross. you're with him you're on the cross too that's not comfortable that's not that's not comfortable right and so this is this is all really important because there's so many narratives that want to appease your identity of whatever it is whether that's your I choose my political status because of my class, my tax break, whatever kind of constitutional rights I have, or I think I have, which you don't really, sorry. Um, I choose whatever because of my gender, my ethnicity, all those things are problematic in of themselves, right? When they when they kind of when they can constitute the whole, that's fine. But if like you have like this kind of like one trick pony, if you're like a one. A, a kind of one one issue type of person it's going to be tough for you because that very thing is probably what needs to be crucified and that's the thing that the, the conspiracy stuff and and really not having a formed soul not being able to discern this is why having discernment and having formation this is like catechism so important right i can't tell you how many times i hear oh, i wasn't catechized and like this and that's like yeah if you're not actually catechized that's a problem if you haven't been formed on how to how to live the spiritual life, you have a problem and you need to have it fixed. Yeah. And catechism as a continuous thing, right? Oh, like not not yeah. just the, before you were accepted into the church, right? Yeah. It's like continuing to be catechized. Yeah. Continuing to be catechized. It's so important. It's so important because um it isn't for everyone. Like that's another thing too. Like part of the way the conspiracy theory thing works is that, you know, thanks to Protestantism, that's ingrained in everyone that you're your own Pope, that you have just enough to always know what's right. No, you don't. Yeah. No, you don't. You know what I mean? This is, this is why, you know, people glob onto these things because they think that they can know, they can tell. Um, it's like, <clears throat> I remember, you know, I, I'm just, I'm watching some of these things. There's some interesting things in regards of, the conversation swirling around Kanye right now, and especially with like, not especially, but also because he's associated with Nick Fuentes. And so there's this Catholic piece and he's dropping some things here and there on Catholicism. And so like, I'm, I'm seeing a couple interviews with people like this Bryson Gray guy and different people, they're starting to ask questions. And the thing is, is like, just reading some of the, um, the body language and some of these arguments and actually listening to what people are saying, you know, it's like, Oh, you have this opinion on something, but you don't have any real experience or means yeah. to really discern why that opinion, why you should have that opinion. You know what I mean? You're not even, but it's, it's, and it's almost, I, it's interesting because I had uh, in, in like one of my private groups, we had this exact discussion, uh, relative to Kanye and it was like you know somebody somebody had said something about you know he gave this thing I see he had walked out of a, a church I think last Sunday or something mm -hmm. like that and he was sitting in front of his car and this probably you, you probably saw yeah. this father and he said you know I don't want to hear anything about Mary you you Catholics about Mary and all of this and and you know somebody in this group had said oh you know I said this this you know I, I don't know about this because if he's talking about Mary this way and I said, well, but hold on, hold on, hold on. He's talking about the Catholic conception of Mary, 
Sure. Which there's aspects of that that we as Orthodox say is heresy. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> right. Like immaculate right. conception. Like, right. so if he has no experience of the Theotokos. Right. That's right. Which I had none. Right. Right. And it's like, that's not the same person. No. Right. right? So not... just because he's saying this name, right. right, that's not the same spirit. It's not the same icon it's not the same it's not the same person right right and so it's like until he says something about i've experienced the theotokos and i have now rejected her right i've experienced christ in an orthodox context and i have now rejected him right. until that point it's like because you know it's, it's gotta it's yeah go ahead Paul. because, I'm sorry. because here's the thing and, and i think we were talking about this in our thread but i was like I, I i remember being in those spaces myself me too. Right. And that's why that that's why it's like this is why okay, let me put it this way. I think this is one of the reasons why this conversation is important right now is because let's not be quick to judge, not in the way of like accepting everything, right? Because you we stand there's no place else for us to go as Orthodox. Like this the orthodoxy is the end of the road. And if you don't know that, woe unto you. Like I'll see you later. You go and you do the prodigal son thing, but I guarantee you, I, I, I'll, I'll bet all ten fingers and toes, right? It's not going to work out for you because there is nothing else. Like this isn't just kind of like our opinion. <laughs> the Orthodox Church is the Church of Christ. Jesus Christ is God. The Holy Trinity is God. Period. Point blank. Like okay, full stop. Now, that being said. We all did not have that fullness of revelation. And we all did not come to a place where we were saying, I need to be changed by the church versus me trying to change or to form my own thing. So that's why I'm saying we need to not be quick to judge, not in the sense of accepting the opinions of someone like Kanye or whatever, but being patient and allowing it to be revealed. Are, is he? I think he's on a journey. So let the man have his journey. But know firmly what the truth is and be ready to explain why something's wrong. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? But giving someone that space, whether it's Kanye, whether it's Kenny, whether it's Coco, whoever the person is in your life that's in that space, because that's one of those big mistakes a lot of people make. It's like, you know, the chrism's not even dry on you. And all of a sudden you're like telling everybody, why don't you get it? Why don't you get it? It's like, what is, what's the thing you always like to say, Andrew? It's like, from Fahrenheit 451. Um, oh, careful, Montag. That was you two weeks ago. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know? And so I say all that because, you know, again, what's this about? Is this about, uh, you know, uh, Stuart and I were talking about this a couple weeks ago. This isn't about, like, hoping that there's going to be some sort of um, orthodox political party that's headed by Kanye. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's not what this is about, right? what this is about is souls and the gospel, the, the real gospel, the Orthodox gospel, finding cracks to get out and to shine on this broken, fallen, damned society. Cause this, this society is damned. We are, you know, we, we are a Sodom and Gomorrah. We are a Babylon. I'm not saying we're the, although, you know, I, I, I could mean, say that. I could say that. Right. <laughs> But but I, I think I think this tension is the tension of, of what it means to be a Christian. There is this great um I don't know if Cyprian or one of you guys could pull it up. It's it's by Diogenes. I'll pull it up. Um there's this incredible, it's like he describes, you know, like what what are Christians, mm. right? And <clears throat> excuse me. It's so, you know, uh, obviously, you know, not, you know, pun, it's, it's so timeless. It's so timeless and, it, and it's needed. This perspective is needed now more than ever um, because the reality is, is that how do you carry this tension of, and I think this is where a lot of us, we have, look, people have these desires. People in the Hebrew Israelite stuff, they're ashamed of being, you know, blacks and the sons of slaves 
So it's like they have to try to fly. They have to make up something to say, like, we're Jews. I'm sorry. OK, but it's the same thing with someone who's like, you know, the type of nationalism, like American nationalism. That's just foolish because. Um, the reality is, is that at any time our country could change and fall. And then and then what are we left like we have to live in such a way that our citizenship is found only truly in heaven and in Christ. And it's it's in that place where we have not just true security, but true freedom. And that freedom is something that can't be can't be taken from us. Um, is this it? Christians this is are it indistinguishable right yeah. from other. You, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and read that. OK. Uh, this is, I think it says from a letter to, a letter to Di Diagnetus. So Christians are indistinguishable from other men, either by nationality, language, or customs. They do not inhabit separate cities of their own or speak a strange dialect or follow some outlandish way of life. Their teaching is not based upon reveries inspired by curiosity of the curiosity of men. Unlike some other people, they champion no purely human doctrine. With regard to dress, food, and manner of life in general, they follow the customs of whatever city they happen to be living in, whether it is Greek or foreign. And yet, there is something extraordinary about their lives. They live in their own countries as though they were only passing through. They play their full role as citizens, but labor under all the disabilities of aliens. Any country can be their homeland, but for them, their homeland, wherever it may be, is a foreign country. Like others, they marry and have children, but they do not expose them. They share their meals, but not their wives. They live in the flesh, but they are not governed by the desires of the flesh. They pass their days upon earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Obedient to the laws, they yet live on a level that transcends the law. Christians love all men, but all men persecute them. Condemned because they are not understood, they are put to death, but raised to life again. They live in poverty, but enrich many. They are totally destitute, but possess an abundance of everything. They suffer dishonor, but that is their glory. They are defamed, but vindicated. A blessing is their answer to abuse, deference their response to insult. For the good they do, for, for the good they do, for the good they do, they receive the punishment of malefactors. But even then they rejoice as though receiving the gift of life. They are attacked by the Jews as aliens. They are persecuted by the Greeks. Yet no one can explain the reason for this hatred. It's, it's a, there's a lot of the Beatitudes in there. That's right. A lot of the Beatitudes. Should I finish? I mean, I mean, two more paragraphs. Just <laughs> may as well, right? Off, yeah. To speak in general terms, we may say that the Christian is to the world what the soul is to the body. As the soul is present in every part of the body while remaining distinct from it, so Christians are found in all the cities of the world, but cannot be identified with the world. As the visible body contains the invisible soul, so Christians are seen living in the world, but their religious life remains unseen. The body hates the soul and wars against it, not because of any injury the soul has done it, but because of the restriction the soul places on its pleasures. Similarly, the world hates the Christians, not because they have done it any wrong, but because they are opposed to its enjoyments. Christians love those who hate them, just as the soul loves the body and all its members, despite the body's hatred. It is by the soul and closed within the body that the body is held together. And similarly, it is by the Christians detained in the world as in a prison that the world is held together. The soul, though immortal, has a mortal dwelling place. And Christians also live for a time amidst perishable things while awaiting the freedom from change and decay that will be theirs in heaven. As the soul benefits from the deprivation of food and drink, so Christians flourish under persecution, under persecution. Such is the Christian's lofty and divinely appointed function from which he is not permitted to excuse himself. Wow. I mean, Mike drop. Wow. Mike drop. Mike drop. If you want to know what it means to be a Christian, if you want to know everything that wow. I've been trying to say through this whole project, that's it right there. Wow. That's it right there. I'll put a link to that in the description if people want to go yeah. bookmark it and read it a few times. It was I can't remember who it was, but there was some letter it was talking about like Christians act like they're tourists. It was like from like mm. you know, it was from the pretty early days. I can't remember what it was, but Christians like are passing through like this is just like a neat place that they're hanging out with for a little while because they know like this is not home. 
so they don't get like too invested in anything they don't like put their like all their stock in anything not all their eggs in one basket they're like which you know <laughs> presents its own problem and speaking of the mental health thing is like this is something that i find visibly people when i'm working with them they visibly relax when i say this that like no life is brutal like life is incredibly challenging and it's not really meant to be enjoyed and then i say a lot of people feel like that when they're not enjoying life they're missing out on something mm. and here i am like christ is here to relieve that burden from you mm -hmm. like if you feel like this is all you got you got to make the best out of this life like christ is here to relieve that burden from you because it's like new year's you know everyone always feels it's like you know younger people yep. not me yeah they feel this yep. pressure to make the most out of new year's and it's like yep. no it's just and it, another and arbitrary day and honestly, I think that's the thing too, is like, if you, first of all, hopefully you're in a place where you're either were taught that, you know, you were given this, you know, worldview, this phronema that was just spoken of in that letter and what we've been trying, you know, to present in this project. If, if you aren't in a place where that's being presented to you, or, you know, hopefully you're in a place where you're trying to achieve it. Like, but once you have that, the trick then is to live it daily. Because I'm going to tell you something. That's where, you know, that's where we get undone is when we forget that. That's when we get to this place where it's like, I can't handle it. You know, this and that. It's like, oh, you forgot. You you forgot that you're in exile. You forgot what that that this life is is for repentance you, you've forgotten those things you've forgotten that you're a christian and you've forgotten what it means to to live in this world as such and and it's it's in that yes. forgetting that we get into all these problems and that's again forgive me for going back to it i know i'm like a pit bull you know chewing on a bone but that's the thing with the weaponizing of the conspiracy theory is that it it, it in some ways it's there to almost give someone a weird false sense of comfort of like, no, you see it correctly, you're in control and you can have a pathway to, you know, kind of reconciling the the suffering of this world without doing it God's way or Christ's way. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like Yeah, you know. except Father, almost all conspiracy <laughs> theories like that I have found the nature of them is, you know, when you really scratch the surface, it's like, here's the narrative. And the narrative is such that there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's yeah. other, it's other people doing things. There's nothing that you could do about it. You're a victim. Mm -hmm. You're right? a victim. You're a victim. You're a victim. You're a victim. And, and at least be like, at least now you can rest in knowing that like you're a victim and it's not your fault. The world is messed up and there's nothing you can do about it, nor is there anything that you have to do about That's it. That's right. That's right. Because I, I want to say this too, because just so we're clear, I, I really want to make this clear. Um, as Christians, we totally believe in conspiracies. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's part, that's like, so world path moment, right? Just so we're clear, um, that's a, that's probably still a bigger problem is that people don't believe in conspiracies. But if you're a Christian, you have to believe in conspiracies because the Jews conspired against Jesus. You know what I mean? They conspired against Paul, right? I mean, we can go on and on about conspiracy, right? So conspiracy, you if you're a Christian, this is an absolute statement. You have to believe in conspiracies, right? What we're talking about right now is is the uh, the other hand, the the left the left hand of this, right? In regards of you know having conspiracy to be your kind of like parachute, you know, this is the Hebrew Israelite, this is you know the Christian identity white supremacist guy, this is the you know golden throne of MAGA, this is like the communist. This is the Marxist. This is like whatever your thing is. This is the, you know, uterus, uh, all men are evil. Like whatever the thing is, you that's your kind of parachute to kind of justify and and, and explain away things. But what's fascinating to me is um, once you apprehend this and you're like, 
because I, I mean, here's the simple formula. Is there a conspiracy? Yes. Um, are there conspiracies, plural? Yes. But here's the thing, here's where it all converges. How, here's how you reconcile it. All conspiracies are there to undo the authority of Christ and to separate human souls, if possible, from Christ, period. That That's, that's what that boils down to. Now, getting back to, you know, that sounds very really like a fundamentalist explanation to some people. But if you take into account the, the totality of this conversation, speaking of the three wise men, and so what, when, we, when we're speaking of Christ, who we're speaking of? You know what I mean? We're, we're, we're speaking of the, the Pantocrat, the ruler of all, right? So it isn't just about um, Christ only accepts this kind of like, Christ accepts all those who would bow their knee to him. You know, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, um, slave nor free, male nor female in, in Christ. Like, this is this is why the Catholic the, the Orthodox Church is the Catholic Church Universal because it it has room for all small people. C. Small C. Small C. Yeah. Small C. Yeah. So take that. I mean, and that's that that's kind of like the conspiracy theory is the same thing as with uh Christmas, like it lacks center. When like, yeah, so what? You you've perfectly projected how like there has to be a second shooter at the JFK assassination or whatever. You know, there has to be. There's no way that Lee Harvey Oswald could have made the okay, so what? Like you figured it out. Congratulations. Like, wow, government's evil. Oh, who knew that? You know, like everyone knows that throughout the dawn of time. You know, like um, so without like, okay, so what is the whole big thing here? And I remember like thinking that when I didn't so much believe in quote unquote conspiracies. Like, what is the glue that holds all of this stuff together? Nobody's able to do this because you've seen people try to merge on a highway. Like, there's no way there's like long reaching <laughs> global conspiracies. Like, there's no way. And it's like, oh, you get the X variable of powers and principalities. And uh, then suddenly it all clicks and you're like, oh, OK, so really what's happening here is a spiritual war made manifest on the physical plane. And the same way it's always been done, manifest through, I mean, it's not like God sent an army of angels to clear out, you know, in the book of Joshua, like, you know, he used an army of Israelites, you know, and then like what was used back was physical things. So it's just always been a war of like physical things uh, or a spiritual things made manifest physically. So once all those components come together, then suddenly you have a center, you have something to build around, you have like a, a, a starting off point. Well, forgive me, not something the thing the thing capital t capital thing. t the thing which is christ you know so like the center of everything you found it you know congratulations like now you get to spend the rest of eternity figuring out or being shown what the thing capital t capital t is you know and how he works so you know well and the, it, the other thing andrew in that i mean again to get back to like the pragmatic is that that orientation, having Christ as the center, having Christ as the king, like that works regardless <coughs> of if you even ever know about this certain conspiracy that somebody's talking about. Sure. Right? Sure. Like, like it works whether or not you're talking about the how fiat money is created or who shot JFK or, you know, any of these things, the Gulf of Tonkin or whatever. You don't, it doesn't, you don't need any of those things, but if you have it, then it explains those things too. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right? And for me, that's where I'm like, that's how you know something's true. <laughs> like as above, so below. It's fractal. Mm -hmm. You can apply it to any part of your mm -hmm. life and you're like, ooh, that part of my life just got better. 100%. Wow. 100%. Wow. Yeah. Like, that's, no. that's the truth. That's the truth. Yeah. I mean, because I mean, at the end of the day, like we're all looking for that. We're all looking for that, that, that key that unlocks the chains that has everything start to fall away and you get to shed the baggage. And the problem is, is just that people pick really horrible messiahs. You know, they pick well, really I, I, bad. I, this, this goes back though. And, and again, like I hate to keep harping on it, but I think especially for maybe the people who are like inquirers who, who watch the show, but like, I say this to materialists all the time is that I'm like, 
and it's and again like lives of the saints man this mm-hmm. i used to say this all the time but until i read the lives of the saints i never had the deep level of confidence in this but it's like look if you want to know what's true look for the things the behaviors in the world that people have been doing for the longest amount of time and that they've been willing to die for mm-hmm that they've been willing to one that they've been willing to live for to, mm-hmm. so to devote all of their labor and effort toward it and that they've been willing to die for and that that's been going on for a long long time with millions or billions of people over thousands of years if you when you find that you're probably pretty close mm-hmm. you're pro, you're on the you're on the path toward truth that's a very good signal that something is true mm-hmm. And for some reason, people just can't get that. Like, to me, it seems very obvious, right? Like, if you were going to measure, like, what's true, it's like, well, what is the thing that every single, that everybody does, that they you know, do it forever and why, that they'll Supreme. die for? Forgive me, Supreme, because this Go is ahead. something, too. It's, it's this, it's the hyper-individualism. Yes, I was going to say, yeah. I mean, it's it's the, like... It's that reason- weird. I got to be my own. I got to be my own thing. I don't want to be a follower. Like, no, you're duping me. You know what I mean? It can't be that easy. Like, it's the skepticism. It's the it's it's, it's the cynicism, not the skepticism. It's the cynicism. Yeah, the cynicism, the hyper individualism. It just keeps people from being a part of humanity. You know what I and mean? That, and that's been commercial commercialized and industrialized, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Because like. The easy but difficult answer, which it always is, right? You can't really sell it. You know, when I was like, when I was jacked out of my mind because I never took any steroids because I had to have my shirt off on TV all the time, right? And people would be like, oh man, what do you eat? Like what? And I'd be like, chicken breasts and vegetables. And they'd be like, what? No, but what else? I'm like, water. No, but what else? And it's like, no, just chicken breasts. Well, what about cheat days? What's a cheat day? And it's like- You know what I mean? And it's just like, that's super simple. Couldn't be more simple. But enormously difficult. That's so difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's like, I've just, but, but so many things in orthodoxy in orthodox practices, like there's a level of complexity when you're not used to it. Right. Like memorizing your prayer rule. Mm -hmm. But once you have it memorized, then you're going to have to actually like force yourself to not just like do it and then be like, Oh, I'm done. And I don't even remember. Right. Right. Sure. Like <laughs> I went yeah. through the whole thing and like, I'm, I'm, I'm done. And I don't even rem- remember what, what happened there. You got to I mean, force yourself to it. It's not difficult. It's to, simple. Right. I, I, I mean, it's not complex. It's simple, it's simple but it's, but so it's not, difficult. Easy. not easy at all. Not, not easy. easy at all. No. I mean, to speak to that hyper individualism, I mean, I don't know. And this is a little bit outside my area of expertise. So I'm going to ask you to, I mean, has like, on the whole, has there been like a unified tradition and culture in America thus far? I mean, we've always just kind of had our little pockets. We've like the Italians got the Italians part, you know, like the Irish got the Irish part of the town, you know, the Chinese, whatever the list goes on and on. And sure, you'll find that in other countries, but like that already has the backing of a firm tradition of like, a no, this is the way things are in this country and people have adapted to that culture. I mean, there's got to be a reason why traditions on the whole, aside from the very vapid and shallow ones, such as gathering in Times Square to watch a ball drop or whatever, traditions have never really taken off in America in a huge way. Well, and pop like, culture is unfortunately the inversion of a tradition. Well, and, like, sure. and this is this is where Kanye is not wrong because it's been manufactured. Sure. Right? But I mean, so it's and it's been manufactured by certain groups. Sure. OK, yes, I can agree with that. But what but even then, like that pop culture is in itself as of you know the last 10 15 years so fractured in the first place yep. you yep. can't like so i'm watching you can't Barry's, hold it together yeah you can't hold it together yeah i'm watching exactly right however long ago it was i'm watching dairy girls and they all know these specific dances like they'll they'll dairy girls the show on netflix absolutely wonderful you guys should check it out blah 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 um but like they go to dances and the song comes on and everyone's like oh yeah and they all go out and do all the steps and know all of it and like I was telling my wife, like I've never experienced that once, except for like the chicken dance, whatever at weddings. But like that's not even like that's not anything to write home about. But like I can't sing a song in like a, in a stadium with 
you know, 400 other people or 2000 other people or whatever. And it's like a, a traditional, like American song that goes back to our forefathers, aside from like the national anthem. You guys see what I'm saying? Like, am I making any sense? Like, there's like not this. <clears throat> yeah, but you're right. I'm not saying, yeah, but to challenge you, I'm saying. I don't know if I'm right or not. Well, also, I mean, well, here's the thing. Number one, here's something that like just so many people don't understand this. America is a super young country. Like, I don't think people understand. Like, we don't have a concept of time. You know what I mean? We don't have a proper concept of time. And, and <clears throat> there's that balance of, like, on the one hand, we don't want to be captive to historicity. But at the same time, you have to have a measure of understanding what that means. Sure. You know, I, I mean, look, I... So many people have not left the country. Like there's so many people who have never actually left the United States. So what does that mean? What am I getting at? Well, one of the things that happens when you leave uh, the North American continent, you know what I mean? Is you discover um, it like when you discover buildings that are older than our country that are some of the newer buildings in certain countries. Yes, absolutely. You absolutely. know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so I, I think, I think the world has underwear older than us. I think this is one of the, one of the valid points of orthodoxy as well, because it's the uh, fingerprint of the, the, of eternity is that when you're in the liturgy, Right. And yes, you know, there's there's a measure of development, but ultimately when you're in the liturgy, you're touching something that transcends, you know, time as you as the best that you can understand it. You you're lucky if you can think past your great grandparents. You know what I mean? As an American, I'm talking about as an American. You know, if if you're anywhere else, you can do that a lot easier. Because you you're immersed in it. The 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 essence of your people, like you're swimming in it. Everywhere, everywhere else but here. Like, like that's another thing is everywhere else but here. I think in Canada. Yeah. Yeah, Canada. It's the same, but they're the same place. You go to Toronto. If somebody didn't tell you you're in Toronto, you think you're in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. So, you so I, I think this is really important to, to grab a hold of in, in that sense, because then you could start kind of, you know, looking at the reality of America. And, and I know people get, you know, whenever they get scared or, you know, they, they think I'm being some sort of radical when I talk about like, you know, uh, the kind of formal institution of America, you know, the shelf life probably isn't looking too good. It's like, look, man, if you just read some history books, you'll see it pretty quick. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? You'll see it pretty quick. And so. But Father, but, but forgive me. Do you think that there's a chance that, that there can ever legitimately be an American people? Do you think that there's a chance at that? <clears throat> well, Here's I mean, thing. because we use the term, but it's clearly if you're talking about as a people group, there is no American people group. Like, yes and no. Right. I mean, look, th this is interesting, right? This is interesting because uh, <clears throat> this, this is what I was saying to 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 Mark uh, the other mm -hmm. day, which is um, and forgive me for being self-conscious, you know, or self-aware. I think that's probably my ministry. That's why God has me where he has me, right? I'm not the smartest priest. I'm obviously not the most holiest priest. I'm not the best, you know, like, well, what is the thing? I, The one thing I can say is I'm able to speak to everyone in a way that, you know, I pull all these, all of these aspects of whatever, you know, superficial pop culture we have, it's, in, I've integrated it. In Christ, that Christ was giving the Christ is my center, right? And I'm I'm able to integrate it, and so that you know, being able to speak on these things, like I think that's the only hope for our culture, like that's you know that's 
that's why I, I'm, that's why, you know, we, but I specifically am doing this project because it's like, you know, I don't really care about having a bunch of likes and, and whatever for the sake of whatever. I, I don't care about it. You know, in fact, I kind of don't like it. You know what I mean? But I believe that what's necessary is being able to tell people, like, I, I, I think there is an American person. We mm. are Americans. You know, if the three of us go over to Europe, generally speaking, right, you know, right, right, they're going to look at, you know, literally the three of us and they'll be like, oh, you're American. Those are Americans. Those yeah, are Americans. Inst instantly. They're, they're instantly. not going to go like, yeah, no. oh, there's the black. I mean, they may say no. something to me because I'm a priest or, the, or they'll think I'm a Muslim. I don't know. But like, they'll be like, aside from that, they're not going to go, oh, white guy with dreads, like blah, blah, blah. They're no. like, oh, they're Americans. Americans instantly. You know what I mean? Yeah, so no so I, I think the thing is, and this gets back to the Hebrew Israelite thing, like, and you know, the white supremacist guy too is pretending that he's Danish. You're not Danish, bro. Right, right. You're right, from right, Pennsylvania. Right. You know what right, I mean? Right. You're not Irish, man. You yeah. know, you're from Westport. Yeah. Like, the, yeah. the reality of it is, is we're Americans. And we may be able to harken back to some, you know, old country type of thing, you know, some, some sort of, you know, hallmark in our grandparents' history. But the fact of the matter is, for better or really for worse, we're Americans and there is a shared culture. I'm not mm -hmm. saying it's the best culture. I'm not even saying that it's like a good culture, but it is what we have. And I think in some mm -hmm. regards, that's why people are missing the gospel here because the gospel mm -hmm. is to say like, right? Because you're supposed to go and baptize nations, right? And so that's what people are missing. And, and that's this thing of like, I'm ashamed that I'm a black guy. So I got to pretend I'm a Jew. You know, I'm ashamed that I'm just uh... like, you know, I'm ashamed that I'm really like, think. you know, I, I'm a suburban guy. My dad's a tweaker. So I got to pretend that I'm lineage of like the Waffenhausen, you know, SS, whatever. It's like, no, you're not, man. You're not some super Aryan, whatever. You're not some, you know, whatever. Like you're an American. We're and, like that, and, and if you can embrace that, it, that brokenness Blessed are the poor in spirit, mm. right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Mm. Like that, the Beatitudes are for us because mm. I don't have, you know, I can pine after wanting some sort of rich ethnic like history. I can pine after it, but is it true? And that gets us back to the conspiracy thing. People are lying to themselves through conspiracies and like, you know, this other guy's taking this from me. He didn't take anything from you. You didn't have anything in the first place. Sure, sure. Embrace your poverty. Mm -hmm. That's the power of Christ. You know, once once you embrace your poverty. So, so, so it's the, oh, that's so interesting. Uh-oh. Am yeah. I breaking up? Oh, I got you. Go ahead. You're good. Keep going. There he is. No, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> so we're kind of like up. go 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 we're kind of like talk, the talk. we're kind of like the the and hey go ahead and uh kids cover your ears for a second we're kind of like the bastard children of history right a little bit like because this is it's kind of like i never thought about that as like part of the experiment of america is like what happens when you take a bunch of people from ethnic countries you know have a rich culture pretty much cut them off and stick them in a playground you know, a playground of a country, like what's going to happen from there. And like, you know, I, I think that that's like an argument towards <laughs> small T tradition of how healthy that is of like being able to harken back to a rich cultural heritage. But like, I've told so many people, like, I don't have enough predominant blood in me to like go to a country of my ancestors and they like welcome home wayward son you know like come on in son you know we've been waiting for you to come back so i identify as a missourian like mainly you know mm -hmm. you know uh mm -hmm. i just like no missouri is my home like that is my home mm -hmm. for now you know um but it you know to to like to 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 emphasize what father's saying at a certain point like that's really meaningless at a certain point, because it's not like once I reach the kingdom of heaven, I'm going to be pining for Missouri. 
I won't be, you know, and I won't be pining for like my cultural. It would be nice to meet my ancestors and I pray that they're okay, you know, and like to kind of see like how far back it goes and where and everything. But at the same time, like <clears throat> it's, it's, I don't know. I, I think. Now, let me throw a little bit of spice in here for you. Let me just a couple, a couple just drinks. a little dash. That's all I can handle. So there is a thing though. In regards of culture, there are aspects and there are cultures that do become assimilated into eternity. Mm -hmm. So we're clear. I'm listening. So we're clear, right? Because so relics, right? There's a primary relic, secondary relic, a tertiary relic. Do you know? Do you guys know I'm speaking? No, I do not know. So like a primary relic is like an actual fragment, like a bone fragment. Like the St. Andrew bone. You know, bone, okay. yeah, bone fragment. Secondary relic would be, you know, um, the cassock or the vestment that the, you know, the saint wore. Okay. Right? And then on and on from there, like a kind of like step down. It spreads outward. Right. Okay. So why do why would we venerate not just the bone right the bones kind of obvious right but then like man if you can get the cassock of you know saint Octarius or saint john or say you know whoever you know the head covering of saint thecla it's like like that also can communicate grace why right because the saint has been vested in that are you following me I think so. Are you just following me? Okay. I think so. Forgive me. I, I know I shouldn't do that as much, but I just I don't want to go further right until you get this point. No, right? you're good. You're good. So certain cultures, and I mean, I don't want to give like the formula, right? But certain cultures do become that kind of vesture by which the mm -hmm. body of Christ has been vested in. Gotcha. Do, do you okay. see what I'm saying? Yes. Like yeah. Look, so like Russian, like Russian culture, like Ru Russian culture, Russian After culture. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. aspects of like, you know, when we say Byzantine, Roman, you know, culture, right? Like that's been vested in eternity, right? There, there's going to be aspects of cultures that are going to be vested if they've been able to bear witness and bear the weight of Christ. So, so basically what you're saying, Father, is that we need the american version of a a baptism of kiev that's what we need if it, if, it, if it were possible that's what we need the question mm -hmm. is though do we have the time right which uh you know um but I, I think that's one of the things too about the rise of the nation state you know in history it makes it kind of tough you know what i mean because by by nature it's not as stable it's not it's not the nation state isn't predicated upon the same things that a traditional culture is predicated on yes right because the nation states i mean <laughs> most it, nation states are democracies correct yes but but well they don't have to be exclusively but the key thing about a nation state is that it's predicated on factors based upon governance well, it exists for its own sake, right, Father? Like a nation state sake. exists for its own sake, where, whereas like the state, culture. yeah, within the culture, the state exists for the benefit, like Holy Russia, the state existed for the benefit of the people who were inside the tradition. Uh, in, in Ostensibly, that was ostensibly. the idea, right? Like culture is the fruit of, right? Whereas whereas the nation state is is a means of something. Right, a nation state can't. A nation state can't incarnate oh, Christ okay. the way that a culture can, right? And so, and so, like that's the thing. So, what would what would the opposite of a nation state be called? Like, what would be the term for that? Like a kingdom. I mean, that's a good question. I'm sure there'll be a couple comments. So for the for the I mean, sake of what I'm about to say, can we just call it a kingdom real quick? So like 
a kingdom. So we're talking like maybe like uh the the Greeks. Okay, so we'll just take the Greeks, you know, that were like, you know, they became a nation state at a certain point, right? But like maybe an empire. Maybe it maybe an empire. an empire. That's better. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so then we have an empire. And an empire, maybe, maybe that happens organically. Well, an empire in a different sense too, because we're an empire, right? Right. That the the political, the political organization yeah. of an empire, which would have many different peoples inside of it, right. and some the, of whom were actually very different from one another. The reason I bring up the democracy thing too is because isn't that almost also like an inversion of power? A little bit is like taking the power from up top and giving it to the bottom, like to an extent. Uh, in theory, anyway, in theory, not the way that it actually breaks down, but rather than having and I'm not like a monarch toting like we need to get back to a monarchy, but like at the same time, it's like taking something that maybe because the the kingdom of heaven is ordered, right? So yeah, it, it's heaven, not right. It's not a democracy. It's not. It's a not a, yeah. There's an it's order because there's because the thing is. Democracy is this illusion of the sharing of power, but the 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 desire for power is even problematic in itself. But the ability to participate in the life, you don't need. I don't need power to participate in the life. If that makes sense, you know. What yeah. I, mean? I don't. I don't need that kind of authority to participate in the life. It's like the church, right? Like you don't need. Everyone doesn't need the authority of the priesthood to participate in the life of the church. In fact, if they did, can you imagine what that would be like? It'd be like a Protestant church. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that that's not that's not the thing, you know? That's not the thing. And interestingly enough, I, I think it's, you know, again, I don't want to open this can of worm again, but you know, we would say that this is one of our um kind of arguments against our you know catholic you know friends is that uh you know there's it isn't just kind of the innovation of the magisterium of rome that's a problem of the pope it's like we really do believe christ is the king yeah you know what i mean we, we really do and and it isn't the problem of the office of the pope because pope basically is basically a bishop basically a patriarch just like anything else but it's it's those subtle shifts and the and the view of what that means that's that's the problem right and so because power isn't the thing it's the participation in the life yeah that's that's the thing that's the thing because and again i promise i have a point and i and if it doesn't come together i'll just abandon it but the difference is 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 that one comes about organically so for the sake of what we were just talking about like the empire that we were just talking about like the opposite of a nation state comes about organically and and then well what do you mean mm -hmm. organically so i mean nobody set out or at least up to a certain point nobody set out to say we will unite the german people the germanic tribes under a nation state which will become german now that did happen but like up until that point there were individual like organically like through battle through some cataclysmic event through war <laughs> clearly defined territories were established right and because there's a clearly defined established like there needed to be a ruler now america is very much like a sat down with blueprints to how this country is going to be we're going to call it this and this and this and this no I, no i don't think that's right because i think you're conflating a couple of things there because there's an intentionality that's very much there like in in the opposite of a nation state Thus referred I mean, to as empire. Think about it this way: if I'm if I'm misunderstanding you, forgive me. But okay, that's what Christ does. Christ intentionally is seeking to subdue the nations. That's why Jesus Christos Nika. Christ conquers. It isn't just the demons he conquers. He conquers. You know the. You know why do the heathens rage? As it says in Psalms two, like he's come to conquer the nations, and he's going to conquer the nations. Like sure. let's just be clear. You know what I mean? It's just. Like with the Kilias, we disagree with them because it's like, well, he's not coming up to send, set up an earthly kingdom for a thousand years, and then there's going to be another something else. Like, sure. no, he's going to set up a kingdom, and he's going to rule the earth, and, and the Mikul inherit it, but it's like, it's going to be a kingdom of no end. Sure. You know what I mean? And so he's very intentional in yeah. that. And in I, that's, yeah. 
I get that. That's not what I, and I don't think I can clearly articulate what I'm trying to say. So I'm going to drop it. I agree with you, father there. No, like, I mean, in the Psalms, it's the nations, the nations, the nations. He comes to, he makes the, the councils of princes not, you know, like, it's like, no, no, no. He's, he's the ruler. Like he is coming back. He will be the return of the king. You know, like the rightful he's king. Ruling and reigning now. Yeah. Like that, the portion of it too is like, before you came into the Orthodox Church, if you're a Christian, like you couldn't really say that with conviction. But once you become Orthodox and you start living Orthodox life, you're like, oh yeah, no, he rules and reigns now here. Yes. Like in my yeah. life. And not just like poetically. It's like. No, he tells me what to experience do. Experience that reign in the liturgical and sacramental life as well. That's what people don't understand. Like, you know, they're like, yeah. why are you kissing the hand of the priest? Why are you doing this? It's like, because Christ rules and reigns. It isn't just a figure of speech for us. Yeah. It, it's the totality of our, it's, it's, it's our praxis. It's everything, you know? It's but that... it's also, I think the, the thing that people will get with like, I think maybe where people will perhaps misunderstand the organically thing is that they'll, I think when we say, a, like arises organically people tend to think of like something that like evolves and comes together out of this randomness as opposed to is revealed right like there's this reality that's here and then like we just can't see it all the way but the more we clear it off the more it's revealed that like oh yeah this is how it's supposed to be sure as a, as opposed to like well we don't know how things are supposed to be and then it's just like oh this atom randomly struck this atom and right. this you know, DNA randomly mutated into this thing. And it's it's, it's not because because I think even the American experience is like if you look at how even if if you know, like that colonial history, which I think is fascinating because it's 150 years from yeah. people landing at Plymouth to to the Constitution. And it's like nobody ever learns about that. And I think the reason they don't learn about that is because like you can see that like it was revealed from the beginning that these people were like searching for like that shining city on the hill. Like from the beginning, they were like, we want the thing that represents that. Now, did they hit it fully? No, but it's like we we're looking for the thing that represents the kingdom of God. That is like a reflection of the kingdom of God. Like we are looking for that thing. You know, So, the last thing to, I think Cyprian kind of opened, unlocked something in my mind there. I think what I'm trying to say is and I'll leave it at this. Because after this, I'm done. I think what I'm thinking about is the idea of like a conversation coming about between two friends organically and kind of like a good place. And that's not, again, out of a place of haphazardness. That's not of a place of like chaos. There's a willingness. There's an intentionality at sitting down at the same table to talk. Okay. Versus we're going to sit down at 11 o'clock at this coffee shop and talk about this, 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 and this. And that the, right. the latter option is, I think, is something fairly new. And I'm wondering what like what inversions are at play there to kind of make that kind of frenetic master of my own will type of like energy to that establishment of a nation state. You see what I'm saying? So like at a certain point, like every country formed within the last. It's the enlightenment. Few, it's the enlightenment. I think. I think that's kind of what I'm trying to get to again is that Western sense of thinking of we've, we've got this blank slate in the form of a quote unquote untouched continent. What are we going to do with it? Rather than there's been people like what if white people had never come to America and, and naturally Native American civilization had built to the point where there was, you know, this state, but just rather with just populist with like native americans and a culture see, reaching you, back you bring up a good point we talked about this once before is like you and herman were riffing and i threw it out there i don't know i, I don't know if it got received but like i think people read history wrong personally yes like, i i think like i think even people who are historians or armchair historians i think they're often tempted to read it wrong because they don't want to they they fall in the same track that that professional academics fall into they don't want to look like that guy that doesn't know what they're talking about or his funny duddy or whatever but like and 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 this is part of the trap of critical theory in regards to seeing everything in the context of racism not to say race but racism which is like you can't say then that the hand of god is is weaved throughout history 
because it's like, oh, is God a racist and wants to genocide all the brown <laughs> people and blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Sure. So it's like, you know, that that's all a setup too to undermine the incarnational reality of, of, of God working in history. But the problem is, again, is people, they their idea of history is like, it's been so twisted and tainted with, you know, I mean, for, I'll just say it, because I, I mean it when I say this, I'm not just throwing out that, with, with Marxist ideology. Yes, yes. And the yes. Marxist ideology is like poison and demonic. Yes. I mean, so like that's where all that comes from you know and i think that's the thing is like no like um there is there there are there are patterns and portions of of world history that are this whole idea of secularism it's like god is outside of everything that's more than enlightenment thought that's deism that's, yes that's not true the blind watchmaker that's, yeah. that's not true you yeah. know what i mean and so, you know, the I think about it at least once a month, right? When I'm pulling out what little bit of hair I have left, just over, you know, <laughs> over the struggles of my my lovely spiritual children who I love very much. Like, how are you gonna fix this? How are you gonna make this work, God? How are you going to take all these disparate pieces and us petty broken people? How are you going to make us a people, right? It's the same thing. Like I'm going through the Old Testament right now. I'm I'm, I'm doing this whole like uh, Old Testament in six months thing, right? It's just like, just boom, 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 powering through it because it's like, how, how do you make a cohesive people out of this rebellious, stiff-necked, right? Like that's why he's God, you know what I mean? He and it, it's it's that fractal. It scales up and scales down, you know. And that's why we sit in awe and wonder, right? No man knows the hour of the day, right? Like Christ is the Father is going to reveal something that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Because it's going to be incredible how he's just what he's created. But it's like anything else, he alone can see it because only he has that scope of vision. You know, we're all, you know, this close up on the mural. Sure. He's the sure. only one who sees it as it is. And then when in the judgment, everyone's going to get zoomed back and we're going to see what he's created. And we're like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that is the trick. That is the, the trap of academia is this like, no, I, I got to make sense of this. This has to be a certain way and this has to fit a certain narrative. I think. And you that never will. You never will. There's no end to that. No, yeah, because, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'll leave it at that. Like because it's it's getting late, and I don't want to dive us because I have a feeling that what I would say, Father, would be like, well, forgive me, but that's not the fullness of the thing, and then like start to go on this whole other thing about the parts that I'm not seeing about it, which is fine. I love that. That there's no problem with that with for me whatsoever. But, but I we're think at two hours. We are at two hours, and so like when you're a hammer everything looks like a nail so if you're looking for the oppression of the white man then you're going to see the oppression of the white man and then you've already got your blinders on you're only looking at it from one perspective you know and then you're ignoring the other aspects of this whole complex issue blah 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 so um what's that father because <laughs> because there's both now these days right <laughs> yeah i mean oppression yeah. of and by right so <laughs> i had someone and this is a not a very reputable source, but someone broke that down for me. Someone broke down reverse racism to me the other day. And I was like, I had never thought about it before, but it's like, he's like basically insinuated that the only way racism can come from something, the act of racism has to come from a white person. It has to, because to reverse it means that this normal flow coming out of a white person has to be turned around. So if a black person is racist against a white person, that's where that's just that thing that normally comes from the white person being turned around and pointed back at the white person. So it's like, I, I was like, I had never had that really broken down for me before. And I was like, Oh yeah, that's got some, that, that's a whole other episode. I tell you what, that, I tell you what, that dude needs to come to Saipan where like white people make up 1% of the population and then he can go, or he needs to just leave somewhere and go somewhere where white people are not the majority and be like, Oh, 
oh yeah anybody could be racist yeah. well I think, anybody could be racist <laughs> i think that's his point i think the point is that the term reverse racism is ridiculous exactly yeah, yeah, yeah it's completely ridiculous it's, it makes no sense yeah he's I mean, right this, he's this right dude's, this dude's a skinhead I mean, like outright, like skinhead, like no, like white power tattooed on him, shaved head, everything doesn't believe in interracial marriages, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, he's like, so this is the dude breaking it down for me. But I've never had it broken down for me like that before where I'm seeing this and being like, oh, I didn't really ever think about reverse racism having the connotations that it does. And then the last thing I'll say is that it's a fast. So I'm having pretty much the same thing for breakfast every day, which is just whatever, you know, whatever thing I can find. And I was sitting down today to, you know, we're three weeks in, three, almost like four weeks in. I'm sitting there and I'm like, ah, okay. And then like getting ready to eat and speaking of the Old Testament, I was like, had the thought occur to me, like, I am literally an Israelite complaining about the manna bread right now. I am literally sitting here in my warm, lovely house complaining because the food is bland. And like, that's literally what the Israelites were doing when they were talking about manna. They're like, well... It's great that God's giving us bread, you know, out of the sky. But at the same time, like, can we get something like a little bit more flavorful? You know, I know it does everything it's supposed to, but I'm like, man, I get it, Israel. Okay, I get it, Israelites. I get it because I'm right there with you. I'm still like God is continually providing food for me. And it's just not Papa John's pizza or whatever. So I'm not happy. So I'm like, okay, well, obviously I got to do some work. So, um. Like we said, we're at two hours and my phone is broken right now. So I cannot access email. I know I've been teasing this letter about the kiss. I, I think I'll th I think maybe I'll send it to Cyprian and he can put it up on, on the show description because it's a wonderfully written letter. It'd be a disservice if we didn't address it because it's it's really great. Um, the person quotes the fathers, talks about, you know, all this different stuff. So I, I think it's a really well written letter. Um but I can't access any more emails right now except typing. And I'm not going to do that because that's that's not a great look. So I think we'll just end it there um, with uh, a final question. Father, I know, Cyprian, you probably won't be able to. But can you name the original lineup for the X-Men as opposed to the all new? I think, all I, could, different? I think I could do that. OK, shoot. I think I could do that. All right. Um, Cyclops. Uh, Beast. Mm -hmm. Wolverine. No. Nope. No, he's not in the original. Uh, ah. Okay, I'm already out. I knew. Be okay. I knew Beast though. I knew. No, you knew Beast. <laughs> Father, can you finish? Go ahead, Father. Yeah, Cyclops, Beast, um, Angel, Angel, uh, yes. Iceman. Oh, you're missing one. Oh, and uh, Marvel Girl. Marvel Girl. Yeah. 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 Iceman. I always forget about Iceman. Everyone does. Everyone does. It's okay. Yeah. I mean, people talk about it's Scott. I, asso I associated him with the Spider Man. Uh, the Super Friends? Super and Friends. Firestar? Yeah. <laughs> him and Firestar. Yeah. I mean, everyone always forgets about Iceman because he's not a terribly <laughs> interesting character. His powers are not really that cool early on. Uh, pun intended. Only... That's great. <laughs> and then um, uh, people talk about Cyclops being bland. But Iceman is bland, and so they try to make him interesting by making him gay. It didn't really work because he started. He was. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. That's great. Yeah. Um, I All think, right. Thanks. <laughs> I, but, but Father's like, I'll see you later. Like, that's it. That's it. Mic drop. <laughs> um, so uh, we have our um, we have our store at royalpath.store yep uh and then uh if you wish to contact us it's andrew at royalpath.network uh please send in your questions i've actually been talking with a couple folks um uh kind of going back and forth with you guys it's been really fun um uh i for oh man i don't have my phone otherwise i have me who is the guy who does our thumbnails uh jack is it jack Jack. Jack, Jack, if your name's not Jack, I'm very, very sorry. I don't have my phone. It's broke. It's busted. So I can't, I can't. It's look a consonant up. vowel K. It could be Jack. It could be Nick. I okay. Think it's Jack, Jack or sure Nick. Jack. You are crushing it. You're absolutely, yes, absolutely crushing it. Like you're an artist, learn to take a compliment as well as criticism. So you are crushing it. You're doing a great job. I'm loving the thumbnails. Um, 
Also, we have uh, anytime we mention a song, it generally goes on the playlist on Spotify, which is Royal Path Podcast Music or something like that. Um, and other than that, thanks everyone. It feels like there's something I always mention, but I can't go That's to it. the Ma- Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor, guys, just one more time. Mount Tabor or Tabor. Description. Look in the description. In- info the description. will be in the description. Father, is it Tabor or Tabor? Uh, like how would the Aramaic say it? How would if someone? I don't know. I don't know. I saw. Yeah. Okay. Depends on where you're at in the where you're at in the states, right? Okay. This is the last thing I'll say. Is this is like a thing with me, and I'm trying to, but I'm like, cool. what? <laughs> oh, <laughs> is like there's this band called uh Behemoth, but they're from mm. Poland, and so they say Behemoth. Behemoth. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm like no. I'm not gonna say that. I'm an American. It's Behemoth. Like it. Like people will correct me and they'll be like, "Oh, you mean Behemoth?" And I'd be like, "No, it's Behemoth." So, I think, like, and I think that's that's actually American because I think Brit Brits say Behemoth. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think British English. I think it's Behemoth. Yeah. How's your empire doing, Britain? So <laughs> I mean, yeah. That's what you get for your. That's what you get. Pronunciation. That's what you get. That's what you get for fighting to end slavery. So yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so I think I think that's it. So thank you and thanks for having a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.